If you want, it's Emily Fox. Today's video is going to be the first official read it or unhaul it reading challenge. I am absolutely terrified, which apparently you guys like. The more <laughs> scared I am of a reading challenge, the more torturous it is, the more you seem to enjoy it, which noted. I did a whole video explaining all of the rules, announcing everything if you are interested, but essentially I have 411 unread books in this jar that I have a physical copy of on my shelves. And I did do a prequel video technically, two weeks ago. I'll link it if you're interested. But we have officially removed six books from my TBR, so they're still in here because I will not look for them until the end of the year. But <laughs> we now have 405 unread books on my shelves and I need to pick one to start my week. I don't know what I'm going to be reading this week. And because obviously that cookie jar is too full and this is a high budget production, I'm gonna transfer them in this plastic bag and I'm gonna pick a book. Listen, I just needed something big enough and transparent and this was the only thing I could find. So, recycling, reusing. So, oh my God, I'm gonna try not to drop any. Just checking, I didn't drop any. Um, no, I'm gonna close that bag before they go everywhere. So maybe this isn't gonna be a cookie jar challenge, but just a, a plastic bag challenge. <laughs> oh, this sounds nice. Giving them a good shake because obviously they were all stuck in that container. So, um, here they are. The colors are different genres. If you haven't seen the video, you'll find out now which one I'm reading, which genre, because we're picking it. I am so nervous. So, without looking, Honestly, I'm this scared because I know what I wrote down, okay? And like right now, I don't want to read like War and Peace. I keep saying that one, but that's because I'm that terrified of it. But I am allowed to put one back. But <laughs> I don't want to do this. So I shall be reading. Okay, Yellow is nonfiction. Yellow is nonfiction. So I might pick up a second one to read at the same time because I don't tend to binge read nonfiction. But it really depends what it is. So do you want to read it before me? So I can cheat. It looks like it's gonna be bright, but can you see? Live reaction. Oh, f no. <laughs> oh gosh, I had no idea. Oh my God, okay, let me grab it. This is gonna be a shit show. Okay, so I still have my Christmas decor. We're gonna remove that later this week, but let's go. Nonfiction. Ooh, okay, so my nonfiction are here and here, but the self-help stuff is here, and there it is. Oh my gosh. You are a badass. Okay, um, long story short, I have a friend that really likes self-help books. I don't. I don't know if it's like my brain. I'm too cynical. They make me roll my eyes. I feel like it's just a cycle of like self-improvement that never actually works, I just feel like, I mean, she's still, this has been, what, like five years on my shelf or something, and she's still doing it, okay? She knows how I feel about it, all love, but I read the first chapter, you can still see. <laughs> I I had read the first 12 pages and put it down because, ugh, I, I don't remember exactly why. Literally, I had read like three pages? That's impossible. I, I put it down that early? I'm going to reread the first chapter right now and I'm going to decide if I try to give it a proper shot or if I just unhaul it. Hence the read it or unhaul it. I usually give books one chapter to convince me. Obviously, I can put it down at any point. Again, if you haven't seen the previous videos, I've done it a few times, but I don't remember why I put it down. So let me read the introduction and we'll see if I continue it or if I just get rid of it. So I don't know if I had really stopped at page 12, but I'm at page 16 right now. I read the introduction and my face the whole time was... Because the author straight up starts by saying that she used to think, you know, self-help and all that stuff was so unappealing. And then she proceeds to say how much money and time she has spent on self-help books and like self-help coaches. She makes it sound so ridiculous that I miss that that's how she's making money. Like, she had a bunch of self-help coaches and then produced, like, a course online. Honestly, I see these people as predators. They're literally, like, sharks. Using the fact that we're so unhappy because of the way our society is. And, like, 
blames you for not manifesting more money. Literally focusing so much on money and like the first focus needs to be to make more money. Do you really think people don't want to? It's not laziness. Like lettuce is seven freaking dollars. Like, ugh. I really, really, really hate self-help authors. I said it. And like she's making it sound like people are deeply unhappy because they can't keep a man or they can't stop shoving food in their face. I hate you, Jen. I hate you. Um, I don't think, I don't think this is going to work. I might give a second shot and read the first chapter later on this week. I'm keeping the door open to do that. But like I said, nonfiction is not something I binge read. So we're going to pick up a second book to not replace this one. But I'm telling you right now, I highly doubt this isn't going to be in the unhaul pile. This is not what I thought this vlog was going to be about. We're starting very negative, but I really hate self-help books and like, I don't own many. So, oh no. <laughs> I thought it was pink for a second because of the light. It's purple. Um, purple is classics, which is probably the most terrifying genre I have. Do you want to check it again? So I don't cheat. I don't even know if it's on the right side. I can't see through. So what is it? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. I've been mentioning how much I want to read this. Okay, good, good. Let, let's grab that. Oh, finally something good. I was worried because this is, this is giving me nightmares. So let's pick the next one. So we're back here because my classics are just under. So these are my classics and a room of one's own should be is it here? I did a video with it recently, so I don't know if I put it back. Never mind, it wasn't here. Uh, it's here with the classics I want to read this year. So, yay! I told you I wanted to read it, so... Okay, so on the complete other end of the spectrum, A Rune of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. I've been told so many times to read this. I haven't read anything by the author, even though I have a couple of her books on my shelves, but I've seen quotes of this. It looks great, so... This I'm very excited about. This, like I said, I might give it a little bit of a shot this week, but I don't think. I think it's going to be an on-haul. So it's 130 pages. We can do this. I might have time to even pick another one. So I'm going to read the first chapter now and I'll let you know, but I know I'm going to finish this. Well, this isn't going the way I thought this was going to go. I read the first chapter, which was 29 pages. And I realized, look, I like when they come with the bookmark. Um, so far, it's incredibly boring. I said it. Uh, I believe I had heard the author definitely has like that the stream of consciousness type of writing, which is not my thing. Not my thing. Like the only other author I can think of that I've read books like that from would be Claire North. She wrote The First 15 Lives of Ariagas. I think that's her most well-known book. And that was my biggest complaint in the like three books that I've read by her. I don't really care for that writing style. And so far, Chapter one is essentially the author saying that she's been asked to write this essay because this is an essay and she's on a walk thinking about a bunch of random things. I don't care about the detailed food that maybe the people are having. So we'll see. I'm going to keep going because again, it's so short and I've read already, you know, 20% of it. But I hate when you get a book thinking you're going to give it five stars and then it turns out you're not enjoying it. But again... 20%. It, I can still change my mind. It can still, you know, impress me, hopefully. And in between chapters, I'll try the other book, maybe. Good morning. Um, this is not the kind of review I was expecting to be making this week, so you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm gonna try to gather the amount of brain power I need to go through this. So, I finished a book, um, A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. After chapter one, things picked up finally. You can see I put a bunch of post-its. Um, at first I was very much intrigued and then things kind of took a turn a bit for me. So we're gonna start with the premise and the good and we're gonna go towards the bad. Keep in mind, I read this book knowing absolutely nothing. I didn't realize that this is a classic, but it's like nonfiction, like it's an essay. And the topic is women, sorry, women and fiction. So at first she goes to the library when she's done talking about what everyone is eating <laughs> and she looks into books on the topic finding a bunch of books written by men about 
women, but not so much about books written by women about men. I mean, this was published 100 years ago, 1928, so makes sense. And obviously these men had a lot of opinions, some of them kind of harsh. And she goes on to the topic of would it be possible for a woman to have written something like Shakespeare's at the time? And obviously the answer is no, of course not, because of the concept of a room of one's own. So basically, in order for women to have the freedom and the knowledge, the capacity to write these things, they need to have that space, physical or not. And how basically this is the same conversation recycled over and over and over again. Uh, she was using like men constantly saying um, this would be like a dog walking on their back legs if women were trying to write poetry, for example, because... And she kept saying how history repeats itself and it makes me think how even nowadays we're having the same conversation. Like, I'm sure you've heard like clips or seen clips of dude bros, podcast bros, I should say, talking about how, oh, men invented everything. Like, what did women even invent? Blah, blah, blah. Which like, first of all, the ocean was on fire not long ago. So like right now, this isn't really the point you think you're making. And second of all, of course, if you've prevented women for centuries from getting an education, you can't tell them, well, you have no education because obviously, and it's not something that's going to get solved overnight, right? And even though they didn't have education, plenty of women did invent things. Just the credit was given to men around them or stolen from other men. So like, anyway, so basically saying that, no, it wouldn't be possible for women, a woman to have written Shakespeare, like her fictional sister wouldn't have been able to because she didn't have a room of her own, she didn't have the education, the knowledge, she wasn't able to experience the world, travel, all of that stuff. They were burdened by the daily life, like being forced to get married, uh, to have kids and have to focus on all of these things. They didn't have the space for it. And even she mentions uh, Jane Austen, I didn't know that she had written all of her books basically in like the common living room. So sometimes when people were over, she had to hide the fact that she was writing books. So I didn't know that. So like not only the physical one, but also the knowledge, like I was saying, but for her, the main point seems to be that money was what gave her the freedom to actually write because one of her aunt passed away, left her uh, 500 pounds a year. And this is where I start disagreeing with her because her view is very, like her feminism is very individualistic. There's no intersectionality. And I know I'm seeing this from a 2023 lens, but I, I'm allowed to critique it the way I want to. Um, <laughs> I mean, intersectionality was still a thing. It just wasn't being done. Anyway, uh, so she was mentioning how money was what gave her the freedom as a, I'm assuming the link into it, but uh, a cis, straight, able-bodied white woman. That gave her the freedom to stop feeling as angry and resentful towards men and society. That was enough for her to not care anymore. And this is what I mean by there's no intersectionality because yes, you, because you already have certain privileges, all you needed was money and then you're okay. And that's like her biggest point in here. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I feel like I looked into it because I, I was curious and 500 pounds a year nowadays in Canadian money would be $50,000 which don't get me wrong, that would be nice. That would be great to have 50K a year without having to work. But it wouldn't be enough, first of all, for even myself to stop being angry at the way society is. It wouldn't be enough. And for women that are not like her, it wouldn't stop them from experiencing racism, homophobia, even sexism, like in healthcare, for example, if you're not able, but like, you know, this is what I mean by there's absolutely no intersectionality in her arguments. And then she mentioned an example uh, of another woman. She basically says also that all she needs is money to be able to write. And also she's really mean to her. We're going to come back to that. But on that page, I might as well mention it. She's like, um, no doubt in 10 years, her books will be pulped by publisher. Like they will be destroyed. They're, they're not important. What did the poor girl do to you? <laughs> she mentioned that she's just grabbing her book randomly. So like, anyway, and to give the quote, uh, she's saying how um, if she had the money, she would uh, not need to waste her time reeling against men and basically trying to get rights because she would be able to travel and get knowledge. So yes, I don't agree with her with that. She also as I mentioned, um, wasn't very nice towards some women. Like, she'll be like, oh, I like women, blah, blah. But then she's like, let us agree that on p a paper read by a woman, two women should end with something particularly disagreeable. What do you even mean? There are a few moments that like, I 
we'll actually go ahead and watch, read some reviews uh, on this book because sometimes I'm not sure if I really understood what she meant because English is my second language. Her writing style does not agree with me and it's not the easiest to read. But she had a few moments like that, like writing without emotion. Wh what is that? Um, so yes, that. A few comments like this. And then to further further prove that she definitely only meant women like her at page 136, like it's almost done. She was mentioning how, well, you know, women just have to step it up now because we have rights. And she's saying how uh, we have at least two colleges for women in existence in England. <laughs> because that will change everything. And then she's saying how for a whole nine year now, they've been allowed to vote. Which women? Because it's not all women, it's the ones like you. It's only the ones like you. And we know a hundred years later that nine years being able to vote does not change anything. Like there's still no representation nowadays, good representation in politics. So let alone just voting will be enough. It's anywhere. And then the final note, literally on the last page, to go back to that poor author that she's bashing, she ends her book, and this isn't the exact quote, but seriously, very close. She's saying how if that person had a room of her own in 500 years, maybe she would be able to write a decent book. And that's barely an exaggeration. That's pretty much what she says. So her argument essentially is that women, if they weren't poor, they would be able to be you know, writing books and be equal to men in literature. She also makes another few arguments that I don't really, again, thought I understood, like the emotional one and like how there's men and women in every person. It seems very like... So yeah, like I was saying, I am a little bit all over the place with this book. I think I'm going to feel like that about like a lot of older feminist work because I'm going to go ahead and read some because I'm curious. I think it's important to see where things started, you know, where it's going. Are we still having the same discussions? Which the answer is already yes, but still. I want to see how it will feel, but I think I will have mixed feelings about them like right now. Because I think she has a few good arguments, like the obsession that some of the men authors specifically uh, for the topic of the book are obsessed with feeling superior to women and making sure that they're always doing inferior. And it's something that I've noticed in a lot of books about these topics, like even fiction, just the obsession with hierarchy that I will absolutely never understand. But yes, the fact that she's like, I need not to hate any man, he cannot hurt me because she has money now. It's just, it's not good. I need a few days. Uh, we are day four. It just took me three days, much longer than I thought it would take me to finish, but I am still in the moment. I'm gonna digest it. I'm gonna go ahead and read some reviews and see how it affects my opinion. Sometimes you read a review and you're like, you were able to word exactly how I was feeling and was not able to summarize in a sentence. That's how I'm feeling right now. I'm like all over the place, but I have strong feelings, very strong feelings. I think I'm gonna give it a three stars. Again, this is not what I thought I was going to be reading this week. Like this is technically nonfiction and I wasn't expecting that. I'm still planning on reading more by the author because I do have some of her fiction work on my, uh, my shelves, but I will be more prepared for her writing style. I don't think she's gonna become a favorite author, but I might change my mind once I read her stuff. But yes, this book was nothing, nothing like I expected. But I do agree that you can not expect someone to be able to do literally anything if they don't have a room of their own physically or not to have that freedom to write books again to go back to the topic of the book. So yeah, that's my opinion. Like I said, this is just heavy, uh, much heavier than I expected. I did not make any progress on this one. I'm giving myself till the end of the week to try to read more. If I don't read any more, like not even a page, I'm getting rid of it, but I'm hoping to read one more chapter so I can make more of an opinion than just the introduction. Like, come on, Emily. Uh, so it leaves us with enough time to read another one. Hopefully it would not be, it will not be as heavy of a topic. I was not expecting to be analyzing the feminist movement this week. So just to show I'm not cheating, where's the zipper? Okay. Hopefully it's not too big too, because I have three days. I mean, if it's too long, I'll just continue to vlog obviously, but something lighter, please. <laughs> because my gosh, this week. Okay, I think I have one. What color is it? Ooh, it is green. Green is fiction. So, uh, yes, it is fiction, but it's fantasy. 
I think the only thing that worries me about fantasy is that some of them are really big. Some of them are really big. So I don't know if it's on the right side or not. I'm not cheating. I really am hoping that it will focus. Otherwise, I'm doing this for no reason. So, oh, f <laughs> okay, this is negative. Um, it's not that I don't want to read it. It's just not right now. This is Under the Red Skies. This is book two after uh, The Lies of Loch Lamora, which the reason, okay, let me grab it. Okay, so fantasy are these two shelves and it's, oh, I have to go behind the, the chair. I think it's over here. Where is it? Oh, it's here. There you go. There you go. <sighs> this is it. I am such a silly goose because when I wrote the title, I wrote half of it apparently because it, this is Red Seas Under the Red Skies and I just wrote Under the Red Skies. Anyway, so my reason for reacting like this is that first off, it's kind of chunky. Uh, second of all, it's a series that isn't finished. I believe the author has been dealing with health issues. So like a lot of his books have been put on pause this series. And I had read book one, The Lies of Luck Lamora, super popular adult fantasy. And while I really enjoyed the characters, I didn't really care that much about the plot. And like overall, I went into it thinking I was going to give it five stars and I ended up giving it 3.5, 3.75, something like that. It was a little bit of a letdown, but I have heard that book two is better and it has pirates. So I am looking forward to it. Maybe we'll balance out. <laughs> rest of the week because oh my gosh if I had known it was nonfiction, I would have right away picked up something else so I could like flip-flop between the two because trying to binge read this with that topic was a lot it was a lot so yes four days probably will take me more than that because it's 600 pages so maybe I should give myself six days we'll see but hopefully I read it all I'm gonna read the first chapter today and update you it's technically 40 pages so I will definitely read 40 pages today I'll update you tonight to let you know how I feel about this one, but I don't think this is really a book that I need to do the read it or unhaul it, like read a chapter to decide if you're going to get rid of it challenge. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. No. No. Just no. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but no. Listen, I actually finished a book. I didn't update because I thought it was funnier to just be done with it and be like, no, no, I was wrong. Okay. Here's the thing. You know how I just did like a 15 minute review of a 100 pages book? We're going to do the opposite. This is going to be like a three minute review of a 600 pages book because I figured out why I didn't care about book one that much. Again, similarly, the plot is interesting. You have, uh, I'm trying not to spoil anything from book one, but essentially there's still a heist. Uh, there's still some great friendships. I don't mind the writing style, but it is way too slow paced, way too slow paced. The dialogues are fine, but the other sections, very long descriptions, I just lost interest. And I don't know why, I think it's just the mix of the pace and this specific plot because I've read plenty of books that are slow paced, but it doesn't work for me in this case. And it was the same thing with book one. So I was quickly reminded and I said that there were pirates. Uh, I took 200 pages to get to said pirates. I just wasn't emotionally invested, sadly. I feel like this used to be everywhere. People were recommending it. I haven't seen it so much around lately, so maybe I'm not the only one that just didn't really care for it. But the good news is that even though I forced myself to finish this and I shouldn't have, I should have just learned to put it down because I was clearly not enjoying myself. This is a series that I'm giving up on, which I have a challenge this year where I want to finish or abandon 10 series. We have our first one. Frankly, I think this is the only reason I finished it is just because I knew it was going to be my last book from this series. I'm giving it 3.25. I've never, I don't think I've ever given 3.25. We're going to go for that. I'm going to round it down to a three. There's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't work for me and that's okay. So successful. Two that are read and finish. And then this one, I did continue and I did figure out why. I put it down the first time. It was not at page 12 like I thought. Uh, no, it was definitely a chapter two because I, I did the same thing. I got to the point, I was like, this is it. This is why I put it down. Because chapter two, you can see the title. It says the J word, the G word. In French, it's the opposite. Uh, so the G word meaning God. No, no, we're not doing that. I don't care for self-help to begin with. I was very vocal about my biases in the intro of this video, but I'm also not religious whatsoever. 
and I very much resent whenever someone is trying to shove their religion down my throat, which I don't even know if she really goes there, um, but she's like, you know, God basically sneaked up on me. And I resent it because in the intro, she's like, oh, this isn't like other self-help book. I've tried them all, they never worked for me. And then she proceeds to do the exact same freaking thing that I hate in every self-help book. So, you know, you know? If this worked for you, because I know this was really popular, I'm actually genuinely happy for you, like no sarcasm. But this is just exactly what I mean when I say that I really dislike self-help. Because if you go back to chapter one, because I did read it, I feel like she starts already to have claims that aren't necessarily true, and then some of them are straight up offensive. Um, she mentions how like our frontal lobe doesn't fully develop until around puberty. Was it something we didn't know 10 years ago? Because it's around 25, but okay. And then she mentions the example that I said was straight up offensive because she's giving up, giving examples once again of like things that people can't do in life. And she's like, we don't realize that by eating that fourth donut or by ignoring our intuition and marrying that guy who's awful, blah, blah, blah. Just those examples piss me off. But at the bottom, she gives example of like conscious versus subconscious mind. And she's like, conscious mind, I want to lose 25 pounds. Subconscious mind, people aren't safe and I must build a shield to protect myself. That is fine. But then she writes, body, a fortress of flab. So she wrote that down. Like she taught it. She was like, that is good. She wrote it down. And someone else edited this book and read this and was like, yeah. We're gonna publish this. I listen, I, I'm sure I would find countless more examples if I were to continue this book. I, I just can't. I'm not enjoying it. What's the point? I knew right away when I picked it up it was going to be on hold. So I just now feel more comfortable having read some of it, reminding myself of why this isn't for me. So three books from the jar, the plastic bag. <laughs> Now gone, which I think I'm going to start counting, by the way, the amount of books that I've read instead, because from the bag, I will be reading books randomly throughout the year from my shelf that are in here. So it wouldn't count to count, you know, from 411. So instead, we're going to count the amount of books that I have read or unhauled. So the prequel video, there were six books and then three more in here. So nine books total that are now not part of the plastic bag, uh, feel free to leave your predictions in the comment section. How many books do you think I will read or unhaul throughout 2023? My prediction, I mentioned it quickly in the past video, I was aiming towards like 50, 60. I, I have no idea because it really was going to depend on the week. Sometimes it took me way more than a week, by the way. I said four days for this. It took me more than a week. Like, Let's be real. I'm not sure how I feel about this first episode of uh, this vlog series, but I guess it was somewhat successful. Went through three books. None of them were five stars, but they were books that had been on my shelf for years. Like this one was from pretty much the beginning of my booktube journey. This one was a couple of years. This one is more recent, but you know. But these two, I'm actually really happy that I went through them, attempted to go through them, and will be unhauling both of them. The next vlog for this series is going to go up in March because in February I will be doing the one week one shelf challenge all throughout the month which is kind of similar but not really. I get to choose which book I read from you know the shelf that I pick. It makes things easier for me. So yes definitely a subscribe if you don't want to miss that out. Thumbs up and I will be putting more videos on the screen that I recommend you check out including the prequel that I mentioned if you haven't seen it. Things got interesting. Yeah let's just say that. <laughs>